Okay, so we did quadratic irrationals. I'm going to talk about distribution stuff first and then homework next. So don't be too, too far away. So, first let's kind of step back and do something very. Whoa! Their video is playing. Deja vu. Why is that happening? Hello? Feedback. Okay. So consider something sort of, I don't know, if you have any real number you can consider it's base 10 expansion, which is a bunch of digits. And these digits are, of course, numbers between 0 and 9. And you can just ask, how are they distributed? Okay. If you've ever done this, just take a number, like pi, and look at its digits. And you start wondering, maybe does every digit come up equally likely? Or does 3 come up way more often? That sort of thing. Who thinks that every digit comes up with roughly equal probability for pi? Up to what point? In the limit. <laughs> One hand? Two? Three? Okay. Some, and everybody else thinks they don't? <laughs> okay, good. So a lot of people think they do. Yeah. Um, so let's just look. Uh, here's an example. So I wrote a little interact. What it does is, here's all the code for this. What it does is you type in a number, a number of bits of precision that you want to compute it to, and then what it does is it takes all the digits in decimal um, and then draws the corresponding frequency histogram. So if you look at the first few digits of pi, um, maybe it would be nice if I printed out the number at the bottom. Uh, so you can see it. Okay, so here's, doesn't, oh, sorry. So here's pi, 3.14, and notice there's two threes, so that gets a little bit taller than two, there's only one two in the decimal expansion. And so that only, that, this is, um, it's a frequency histogram normalized so that the total area under this is one. So Now if we increase the number of bits, what it's doing is it just computed all these digits of pi. And then what it did was it counted up the number of zeros in the expansion and put it here, the number of ones, the number of twos, and so on. That's what this histogram is of. And it divided them up into 50 bins, which is kind of silly because there's only 10 digits. Um, that looks a lot better. Maybe 20, so there's some space between them. Okay, so there you are. And uh, this is what the distribution looks like. And if we increase it to 10,000 bits of precision, then that's what the distribution looks like. Okay. So it's kind of uniform, but you know, it'd be nice to have way more bits to see that. Actually, maybe I'll be less restrictive and allow to 100,000 bits. Why not? A pretty good reason not, because I, because I just activated the garbage collector. Great. In case the garbage collector exceeds my patience, I'll just open it here. Okay, so now we can go up to 100,000 bits, I think. Yep. And there we are. I'll again use 20 bins. So it's looking pretty uniform, um, as you can see. Okay, uh, let's take another number like, uh, I don't know, two sevenths. Pretty simple looking number. Not so uniform, obviously, because if you think about it, it has some nice little repeating decimal expansion, and that decimal expansion doesn't involve every number, but it involves all the other ones and it repeats over and over again, so it's going to be uniform for a subset of the digits. Or you can take another number like E, and look what happens. And there you are, it looks very uniform. Um, of course, any kind of distribution you can think of will happen, because you can just make up a real number, you know, because you can just write down the digits. You can just make up a number by giving the digits of the number. So you can make up any distribution imaginable. Okay, so that's the kind of game we're playing. But uh, here, oh, kill. Um, so one thing here is, this is in base 10. So it's kind of weird because there's this completely arbitrary, uh, just because my hands have 10 fingers, thing where we're doing everything in base 10. Um, if you change the base, maybe the behavior is different. You can imagine maybe there's a number that 
has one distribution and one base, and then when you switch bases, the distribution looks dramatically different. Um, of course, there's a different number of values, but still, um, you could wonder about that. So that's kind of annoying to us mathematicians. It'd be nice to have something more canonical. You can see where this is going. Um, given a real number, you can consider its continued fraction expansion, and that's a sequence of integers attached to that real number, and then you can divide those numbers up into bins, and you get a distribution. You can wonder, what does that look like? Right? could be anything, because after all, you can make up a continued fraction just by making up any numbers you want for the partial convergence, any positive a sub i's. So you could just, you know, you could choose, you can make a continued fraction that's 3 10 times and 4 10 times. So there exist real numbers with absolutely any imaginable kind of distribution for their continued fraction. On the other hand, what happens kind of randomly? And what happens with e and pi and stuff like that? Okay, so should wonder. <laughs> Digits of e, there's a lot of them. Okay, but first, um, it's an unsolved problem, so it really looks like the digits of pi and e, and numbers like square root of 2, etc., are equidistributed, um, but we don't know. So there's a definition, a number is normal if the digits are equidistributed in any base. And the conjecture uh, is that most numbers are normal, and in particular, pi should be normal, but nobody knows how to prove that. So it's what everybody expects. Okay, now let's try to do something very similar, but let's use continued fractions instead. Let's see what happens. Oops. Uh, do we get a little smaller. So you can see everything. Okay, here we are. So I get to type in a number, and then I get to type in a number, and then it will give me the distribution of the partial quotients in its continued fraction. So actually, let's start with the number 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. Oops. Been, oh, this causes trouble because every single partial conversion is 1. And somehow, uh, so every single value is 1. And that just throws off my histogram code, evidently. Sorry about that. So let's see. Let's try I don't know, 17 plus square root of 2013 over 2, just some number. OK, look, so that's what we get. So some value occurs a bunch there, 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 and there. And that's it. So if you look at the actual continued fraction, there it is. It's 30 and then 113, 143, 113, 143, repeating forever. So the distribution of the partial quotients, that is the a sub i in this continued fraction, it's supported on four different things. And in the limit, um, they should all have the same height, uh, except one will occur twice as often. So it's one um, right there, and then the other values over there. And I guess uh, 113. Maybe I need way more to see this limiting behavior. So let's just increase the number of bits. OK, that's better. So. I guess 30 is just one little teeny tiny time thing because it happens exactly once. And then ever after, you get 1 a lot. And then you get 13 and 43 with equal probability. OK, so do you see what's going on here? OK, so now let's look to see what happens with other numbers. Let's see if we see any patterns. Okay, I'm going to take the number pi. Hey, look at that. So that's a. So what I've done is um, the partial convergence or the, sorry, the partial quotients keep getting bigger and bigger. Every once in a while, there's a really big one. And then they're mostly small, and then every once in a while, there's a really big one. So if you draw the frequency histogram, including everything, it's kind of hard to see, because here's what it looks like. Um, a couple of small ones, basically some small ones occur a couple of times, and then that, and then there's almost nothing, and there's like this one ridiculously big one. So it's very hard to look at that frequency histogram. And so what I've done here is um, the top one, I've just truncated it and thrown away every single one of the partial convergences bigger than 50. So that's what's happened here. And um, that gives you a better picture. OK, and if I, can, if I increase the number, so here's what I've done is I've computed more digits of pi, computed almost uh, several thousand digits of pi. It looks pretty nice. Like, maybe there's some really, really nice, clean distribution here. Right? 
and that's for pi. And let's look what happens if I try another real number, like, uh, it's kind of weird. There's a lot of real numbers, but it's hard to think of any in particular. Uh, I don't know, root of 2, sure. That's a real number. Hey, it looks exactly the same. Weird. Um, what about, so just to check that the code isn't all broken, what happens with square root of 2 plus, or square root of, I don't know, 17. Okay, that's all special. Some repeating thing. But, okay, let's try 5 to the power of 1 17th. Hey, it looks the same. Isn't that weird? Any number that we try to think of, it's looking like this. Though, again, I want to emphasize there are lots of real numbers that do not look like this. Because you could make up your own real number by just simply making up any sequence of integers, positive integers you want, and saying, consider the um, limit of that, you know, consider the value of that continued fraction. Okay? And that would be like completely different than any of the pictures I'm showing you. So you can get any distribution imaginable out of this process, but if you take a random number, this is what it looks like. So that's a theorem actually. That for a ran it's a theorem due to Gauss. So a very, very old theorem. That if you take a random real number, its continued fraction distri um, the distribution coming from its continued fraction looks like this. Unfortunately, it's hard to know a particular random number. So though pi looks like that, it's an unsolved problem to show that pi actually has that as its um, continued fraction of distribution. And similarly with every other, with several other specific numbers. By the way, let's see what happens with e. e is completely different. Despite e being a seemingly randomish transcendental number, you know, it's the distribution gets completely different. Because remember, there's a nice simple pattern in the continued fraction for e, as you can see here. And similarly with the powers of e, as I've mentioned before. So notice again, it looks completely different. Ooh, e to the 20. I think that's probably, that's just due to precision loss, though. Or, you know, not looking far enough. E to the 12. Well, it looks really nice, but it's, uh, it's not really true. There's no, I think all the powers of e have a, a nice formula, but maybe, huh. Well, I don't know. I haven't really thought too much about this. I don't know whether some of these other powers huh, actually obey this distribution and also have a nice formula. It's possible. Um, but it seems like e squared does not, as e does not as well. I actually don't know. Okay, so... Uh, so further reading about this, so um, the distribution is called the Gauss-Kuzmin distribution. And I can show you what the, there's like a nice simple formula for it, which is right here. Um, so there's a simple closed form formula. So in other words, some simple way you can graph exactly what's happening with this distribution in the limit, which is nice. But we have the unsolved problem, does E actually obey that distribution? And we don't know. Okay. So it's kind of annoying, but that's the way it is. All right, any questions? Is that one of those million dollar problems? No. So there are two million dollar problems in number three. One is the Riemann hypothesis which is uh, about the distribution of prime numbers uh, be basically being given by Lie of X. And uh, the other one is the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture, which is something I haven't mentioned before in here, I think. But it says that, more or less, it says that um, it gives more or less an algorithm that lets you find all the rational points on an elliptic curve. So that's the other one. Um, gives an algorithmic way to find all the points on a curve. Although it's not stated that way, but it's somewhat, it's not equivalent to that, but it's, it, uh, it, uh, it's related to that. So um, this is not such a problem. There's a very large number of problems in number theory that are unsolved. In fact, there's a really nice book called Unsolved Problems in Number Theory by Richard Guy, which is just like pages and pages of unsolved problems in number theory. So remember, um, I found that book when I was, some grad student 
asked me whether there are infinitely many primes of the form x squared plus 1 because she needed it for her thesis. I don't know if you guys remember this problem from like the beginning of this class. I gave a very similar exercise. And so I went off for a week and tried really hard to solve this and then finally stumbled upon Richard Guy's book. And it's literally unsolved problem number one in that book. <laughs> and I was like, ah! That was very annoying. Okay, so that's the situation with distributions. Basically, usually what you get looks like this. I'll leave you with that. Um, looks like this. Come on. Hey. That's annoying. Nothing is happening. It looks like that. <laughs> you remember. Um, okay. So looks like that. OK, so that's distributions. Now let me show you the homework that we have coming up. There's, and also really what we're going to do the rest of the class. OK, so first. Uh, the log. Here's what we're doing for actually, uh, yeah. Okay, so starting on Friday, we're going to talk about quadratic reciprocity, which is chapter four of the book. And it's a theory that I just so, uh, explained to you a few minutes ago, the basic question. Um, but basically, the idea of squares modulo p, deciding whether something is a square modulo p, is incredibly deep and involves connections with so many things, it's just shocking. Um, the basic theorems were proved and worked out by Gauss. Um, I don't know if I'll have enough time to prove everything, but um, I can at least give you a good flavor of what's going on here. Okay. Um, so that's the next theoretical thing we'll do. And then we're going to spend the last week doing presentations. So you'll end up giving uh, very short talks about each of your projects. So a lot of people want to uh, find out what other people did, so you'll get to see the details of that. If you have extreme stage fright, or you just hate giving presentations, you don't have to do this. So um, let me know when we're figuring out the exact time schedule. It's not required, but strongly encouraged. But I, for example, remember when I was undergrad, I had extreme stage fright. I was terrified to speak in front of people, and I totally understand. So you don't have to. But it's really good practice as well. Some people love to. Actually, now I love to, but I didn't like to back then. Um, so that's what will happen during the entire last week. Now let me tell you about the homework assignments. Really quick, March 5th yes. is still the guest speaker. Oh, crud. Oh, well, that doesn't uh, impact anything negatively. Yes. Uh, but thank you for, let me, for reminding me about that. Guest speaker, Dan Chameau, uh, about the back door in the elliptic curve uh, random number generator that he discovered. So it's a guy from Microsoft and past UW student who found a backdoor in Microsoft's elliptic curve random number generator and is going to talk about it. OK. That will happen on March 5th, as previously scheduled. All right, now about homework. And thanks for making that remark, because I had completely forgotten. Uh, I would have come in all prepared, and then he would have given the talk, and I would have been, I don't know, would have been silly. Okay, so next homework, there's exactly two homework assignments left, and here they are. I'm just going to open both of them. Uh, okay, so the very last homework assignment is right here. It's going to be due on the last day of class. 11:59 uh, p.m., so on March 14th, and problem one will be to write some comment about all the project presentations. So as you watch the presentations, you can make a comment and just make a list of comments here, and that's to get full credit for the problem. You just make some comment. I don't care how intelligent the comment is, just some comment. Um, so if you don't come to class, for example, you'll have trouble getting all of problem one right. Um, but if you do and pay attention, it won't be hard. You can just like scribble something on a piece of paper and then type it in later or whatever. And then problem two will be to turn in the final draft of your project. Okay, 
So that's the last homework assignment. And then the second to last homework assignment has four problems. And they're the following. Um, let me zoom in a little. So if you've been paying attention to this continued fraction stuff, you'll probably be able to solve this one very quickly. Um, I made up a rational number. It's kind of a cute looking rational number that has something to do with right now. And I tell you what the decimal expansion is. And I also tell you that the numerator and denominator each have eight digits. Figure out what the rational number has to be. Hint, use continued fractions. So that's what you want to do somehow. OK. So that's the first problem. The second problem should make absolutely no sense to you unless you've read chapter 4 already. Um, but it's to, uh, basically this notation means that the number 3 is the square modulo p if and only if p is 1 or 11 mod 12. And um, I will state and discuss the law of quadratic reciprocity. And this is an easy, straightforward corollary of that general theorem, where you just work out what the details say in the special case when q in the theorem is 3. OK? So this will be kind of like a comprehension of what's going on question. That's it. OK, problem 3 is to ensure that you do a few more things in your project. Many of you have already done these things. But in case you haven't, I'm going to make you do them. So one is to use cross-referencing. In LaTeX, to make a cross-reference, you use the command backslash ref, and you give as input a label. And to make a label, you say backslash label, and you give it somewhere else. So um, if you want to do something like, in section 3, we blah, all you have to do is say backslash label, and then just give some completely arbitrary name to section 3. And then anywhere you put backslash ref in that label, it'll replace this entire thing by that section. And it automatically generates what all the section numbers are. It's pretty amazing because you can arbitrarily rearrange all of your tech and it will just automatically fix all of the cross references and numbers. If you've ever used Microsoft Word, you've probably, which you all have of course, you've probably like made section cross references kind of by hand and then when you wanted to reorganize everything they all changed and you had to fix them manually and it got really ugly. Maybe, you should, maybe there's better ways of doing it, but you probably have done it that way. With LaTeX, it makes it automatic. So you'll do that. You'll add something to a bibliography. And you'll also, most importantly, make a rough draft of a presentation using LaTeX Beamer. And in the same directory as this problem, I've given a complete example of how to do that. So you just click here, click on Use Beamer, and here's an example. So... Um, you just have to do document class Beamer at the top. And then you'll end up with a slideshow that looks like this instead of a normal tech document. And each slide you do begin frame and end frame. And otherwise you can put math and do everything exactly like you do already. So it's really powerful actually. Okay, so I'll see everybody on Friday and we'll start quadratic reciprocity. Sure. What? Nope. I, I, like, the way the grade in here works is there's, I think, a total of eight homework assignments. I'm going to take the six highest grades, average them. That's your grade. What? Nope. The... It's um, completely integrated. The, the, your grade is literally an eight homework assignments. That's it. There's no like. Yeah, there's eight homework assignments. I'm trying to insert the graph into my project, but the saving process just takes forever. Okay, let me see. Are you sure you're on? Uh, There's a huge number of errors that could be relevant. What happens if you click on issues? What? Can pull this up to yes, see yes, certainly. What happens if you click on issues?